Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome back to the Max Kolbe Little Orthodoxy Escaping Atheism Project. We are back with Deflating and Escaping Atheism. And also, because we just can't get rid of him, the alien from the planet Menon. Todd, how you doing? I come in peace. Good, good to hear from you. That's an insider joke. He's a Christian called a Mennonite. Anyway... So today, oh, reminder, please give us a like. Please give us a subscribe. Check us out on escapingatheisms.com. Please check out Todd Lewis's In Praise of Folly channel. And definitely go to my homeboy, Deflating Atheism's channel. He's got lots of good stuff going on there all the time. And he makes shorter videos than I do. All right. Today, guys, we are going to be looking at this guy goes by Cosmic Skeptic, right? Yes. And uh, he's got that mean bad boy look on his face because in this video, he's got some questions for the Christian God. Um, and, and I'm really actually surprised at some of his questions simply because he could find the answers out pretty easily. Weren't you telling me, Todd, this guy once actually got to debate Frank Turek? Yeah, the, it was on uh, the, the English radio program, Unbelievable. Uh, hard to believe. Frank Turek, you know, he, he's very, he's probably the most popular evangelical Christian apologist who uses science, uh, but he's also just a smart guy. And, yeah. well, I'm not going to comment much more, except I'm kind of surprised this fellow got to debate him. Uh, anything you want to tell people before we get started, uh, Todd, or should we just go ahead and dive into this, this video? I think we should just dive in. Let's do a deep dive, a deep dive into the careful thoughts uh, and questions of the very thoughtful, I guess, uh, cosmic skeptic. Better, so, better than average. Better than average atheist. Actually, he is better than average. Yes. He is average. So is Godless Cranium, who I keep meaning to get back to and still haven't. <laughs> I'll get to him eventually, one of these years. Okay. Um, here we go. This is only this is barely a three minute video, and it's supposedly deep questions. I'm gonna try try my best to stay silent. I'm gonna wait for Todd or Rob to yell and say they want to stop. So here we go. Atheist deep questions. Atheist deepity begins. Okay. If the God of the Bible is true, and I've got a few questions, why would God make the vast majority of the universe completely uninhabitable? And to that extent, why would he bother making the rest of the universe at all if humankind and the earth are the sole focus of his creation? Why would God, after having created the universe, wait 9 billion years to create the earth? Why would God then wait a further 4 billion years before humans were able to be created? Or if you don't let's subscribe... Stop. Hey, yeah. yeah, let's stop it there. Okay, the first point is, uh, why would he create the universe? Easy, read Genesis chapter 1 for signs, seasons, and uh, charting out of months and uh, years. Uh, that's my answer to question one. Question two, that's a variation of a question William Lane Craig was asked by Christopher Hitchens. He said, why did God wait so long? Well, Chris, uh, well, William Lane Craig said, well, how do you know he waited a long time? If there's another 14, 20 billion years left in the universe, maybe that's right smack in the middle. Uh, you, you, know, you don't know how long or short the time is because you don't know the end. There, 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 there's no point of comparison there. There is no point of comparison. Furthermore, they're all variations on the same question. Although he's not saying it this way, these are all sort of variations on the very familiar atheist seems to me questions. Yes. It seems to me if I were God, I would not make a universe so vast just to put something so small in it. I wouldn't leave an empty universe there for as long as it was empty before we were there. And one of the things that's interesting about your questions, sir, is that, that every one of them contains an assumption. Really, is the vast majority of the universe uninhabitable? What's your verification of that? Do we actually know every form of life, every form of creature, every form of being that may exist anywhere in the universe? Maybe it's teeming with life we don't understand. Second, scale. What does scale have to do with anything? For thousands of years, we have known, and I don't just mean the Christian Bible, although, again, I will say this is, this is including the Christian Bible, but other more, univer more universal concepts of God have it the same way. Infinite, eternal, outside of time and space. A thousand years is like a day. A day is like a thousand years. Time, you know, God's beyond time. So if he wants to fast forward things 10 billion years, he can. If he wants to stop time, he can. I don't think we'd notice if he did. Good philosophical question, by the way. If God ever stops time, would you know? Yeah. You would. 
Well, the other um, thing is, why why would it be the case that it would be a moral fault of God if the universe were empty? Maybe he just likes planets, stars, and supernovas. Exactly. I mean, exactly. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, it's like it's like people like to collect uh, comic book hero action figures. I mean, like, okay, I mean, maybe, maybe, you know, that's the equivalent of that. Todd, Todd's putting it on a level they can understand, but uh, yeah, uh, really. yeah, I mean, just like William Lane Craig said in, in his in his little debate with uh, Sean Carroll, it's like, well, you could just say God is an artist; he makes the universe the way he pleases, you know. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of these are, are kind of uh, grounded in an assumption. When, when, when we're dealing with people who are dealing with, who have finite time and finite resources and finite energy with which to accomplish tasks, then yes, uh, economy becomes a concern. And you can ask, well, why did you, do, why did you not do it in the most economical way possible? Uh, we're dealing with God here who has unlimited time, well, not is timeless, uh, just unlimited uh, uh, resources, unlimited energy. So those questions kind of become void. Yeah, well, let's go ahead and push on, but I'll mention one last thing. Look into current physics, something called the digital physics theory, which is increasingly mainstream and extremely increasingly accepted, which, uh, which suggests, assuming quantum physics is true, uh, just like uh, assuming quantum physics is true, we're in the equivalent of a simulation. We don't know that the entire universe is actually physically there. <laughs> I mean, we literally don't know. We don't know if 10 billion, of, of a billion light years out, the laws of physics are the change. Same, we could be in the equivalent of a video game and those stars just pair to be there because God made them for us to look at. Now you can joke and laugh and say that's stupid, but it's, a, it's, it's an acceptable view within current physics. It may be that the universe is teeming with life elsewhere. We don't know. It may also be that the entire universe was just made for us to look at. Uh, the, the parts of the Bible strongly imply that, in fact, it was all just kind of put there for us to look at and play with. Yeah. Like a, for us. It's strong, the Bible strongly implies that. And it doesn't suggest that, you know, so all of your questions seem just kind of leading like they make it odd. But, in fact, we're talking about a timeless, infinite thing with infinite power in every way. Yeah. Uh, a divine mind, a transcendence running the universe. All right. Uh, I, I actually have an answer to his question. The universe is so vast so that all the civilizations are far enough apart so that we don't all destroy each other. Uh, that's about? right. That's right. I mean, I, I, one of these days, uh, I'd love to talk to a, a young earth creationist and say, what if there are 20 other worlds just like the earth in the world that were created like the Bible? I don't know. That's Now we're getting... Now we're getting into too much weirdness. Let's go ahead and talk more. Let's let's hear, hear some more deep atheist questions. Here we go. Yeah, that the universe is older than 6,000 years. Why would God create all animals with the same fundamental building blocks as if they were all related through a common ancestor? Does I'm going to answer that one. Oh, I, would, I want to answer it too, but go ahead first. I, I mean, I'm the one here who has zero problem with the theory of evolution. I have zero problem with the Big Bang. I have zero problem against most uh, uh, against that theologically. Uh, it's 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 never been a concern for me. But uh, it's very observable in the universe that God likes reusing the same patterns when they're successful, and He likes them. You know, if you want to, if you want to see examples of that, go look at polygons, go look at squares, triangles, look at mathematics, look at the logical way so much of nature repeats itself. That's more of God's beauty, son. He like when when, he, when he's got a good design, he likes to keep using it. And so it should not surprise us that even in the Genesis accounts, even if you read them in a very linear and literal way versus a much deeper spiritual way, and I do think the, the Bible in Genesis should be read spiritually. And spiritual truth is not just metaphor. Spiritual truth is real. Um, but in any case, uh, go ahead. I, I want to hear Todd's opinion. Yeah, the point is this. I mean, that's like asking a question. Why are all of the buildings in my Lego collection made out of Legos, creating the appearance of common descent? Um, <laughs> because I like using Legos to build my buildings. That's why. <laughs> I mean, that's just so asinine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, Rob, you got any thoughts? I, I was distracted because I found my microphone, so how do I sound now? Oh, uh, like a girl. No, I'm just kidding. You sound fine. You sound fine. 
All right, should we keep going? Yeah. All right, here we go. Oh man, I've got two more minutes of this. Despite the fact that this is often detrimental to certain species, why would he not create each individual species from an individual starting point? And furthermore, why would God give animals so many vestigial traits? In other words, features which no longer serve the purpose that they were originally intended for. For example, why are 80% of a dolphin's olfactory receptor genes inactive? Why do men have nipples? Why do humans experience goosebumps if you can't explain these things through evolution? If God is on... Okay, wait, hold on. That's just ridiculous. Um, there's the problem of the ever-shrinking group of vestigial organs. There was a day when evolutionists using the append appendix was a vestigial organ. Turns out it's not. Mm. And with the progress of time, we have fewer and fewer vestigial organs. And second of all, even if we do have a legit vestigial organ, he's forgetting one very key Christian doctrine, the doctrine of the fall. That yep. every, the, the universe has been cursed for the sake of man's sins, so things got broken. And uh, yeah, so I wouldn't be surprised to find lots of broken bits and pieces in creatures and humans, because that's that's the price of the fall. I mean, what's the big deal here? Yeah, yeah. In, in fact, um, again, the Bible will admit to many spiritual truths on the same passage or the same section. Uh, much your best Bible reading, you can find five, six, seven, eight layers deep of meaning in a book like in, in just a passage in in Genesis, but in also in in gospel accounts and other books. Sometimes you'll see multiple meanings at once. But Todd's correct. Uh, in fact, he points to something that like, how do you know something is vestigial? Those used to be just assumptions that the scientists would make because they couldn't think of anything. But like Todd said, increasingly we find that they're not. Yeah. Plus, I, I mean, there are other reasons. And yes, if there are flaws, let me give you this, because I, I, this is one of the things that I point out to, to people who want to debate creationism and the age of the universe using the Bible to me. Uh, one of the things I always point out is that the fall, okay, you know, the human mind and the human soul is considered unique in 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 the Christian tradition, and and Genesis holds that there was this moment when human beings chose imperfection. They chose to disobey. They chose imperfection. Um, and you'll notice that before that moment of 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 imperfection was chosen by Adam and Eve. The lion, you know, animals didn't kill or eat each other. There was nothing but peace and, and harmony. And as soon as that happened, it wasn't just that life for humans got worse. It's pretty clear nature itself took a savage turn. This is why when you go fast forward all the way to Revelation in the, in the New Testament, they talk about the new end times, you know, the end times. And then after the Lord comes, the lion will lie down with the lamb and stuff like that, just like it was in Eden. Yeah. You know, in other words, the the choice of humans to step away from God and to choose imperfection over perfection, which is the best way to read, you know, the story of the fall, if you ask me. They cho we chose imperfection over perfection. The entire universe changed. And there's no reason that change couldn't have been both forward and backward in time. And so, it, it, honestly, it's like... You're looking for something that's not there, guy. I mean, really, it is entirely possible that an event, heck, if you read uh, Stephen Hawking, who I actually have issues with, but whatever, he even points out that at, the ver at a very early critical stage of the universe, after the Big Bang, there was a sudden and unexpected flaw in the explosion, in, in, in the expansion. And it was not perfectly symmetrical. Had the Big Bang, had the Big Bang, uh, what well, we like to say explosion, it's not really an explosion, but whatever. Had the Big Bang emergence been perfectly uniform, we wouldn't be here. The universe would look completely different. But there was one tiny flaw early on that made it kind of swirl out into the complicated thing that we have now. Um, an allegory for the moment human beings chose imperfection thus changing the entire universe. Look, we believe our minds, our souls, extend beyond this, this physical universe too. That's what serious Christians believe, that we have souls, that they're beyond the physical. Uh, th therefore, ideas that matter, and what we do, yes, could have reverberations throughout the entire universe, even though you, with your puny materialist, scientific naturalist mind, can't imagine something on planet Earth affecting things elsewhere in the universe. But there's no reason they can't. 
So there you go. Anything else, guys, or should we keep going? Yeah, I, I, I often hear this uh, from atheists who try to level this at, at Christianity or theism, and they say, well, in light of, of evolutionary theory, we now realize that nature is so wasteful and there's so much... Uh, well, first off, the wastefulness of evolution is just individual creatures dying. It's no... no you know, in, in, on that account, it's really no different than the conception we already had, have of it. But yeah, the uh, uh, writers of the Bible were acutely aware that there is a lot of death, there is a, a, a lot of wastefulness, and there is a very much a brokenness to the world. And, and, and the whole Bible deals with this fact. So you may not like, you may not necessarily like the answers the Bible gives you, but you can't pretend that it doesn't deal with these sorts of questions. Uh, and another thing is going back to uh, uh, what what Todd was saying about vestigial organs. I don't know if you, I don't know if a uh, cosmic skeptic here is going to touch on this. But uh, how do I sound, by the way? Is my mic uh, picking up? You're good. Okay. You're fine. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. But uh, yeah, uh, I don't know if he's going to touch on this, but the whole thing about like junk DNA, and we're finding out that a lot of that junk DNA isn't so junk after all. You, you take it out, and things don't quite work the way they should. So yeah, yeah, he is actually reading. I'm guessing that he got that from an outdated from, from a Richard Dawkins source. I got news for you, son. Richard Dawkins is not really credible as a scientist anymore. He hasn't been in decades. Uh, the whole idea of junk DNA is increasingly being disparaged by biologists, molecular and otherwise, and by evolutionary theorists. Mm -hmm. Also, by the way, a, a dirty little secret is there's a substantial cohort who also think within evolutionary biology who think genetics themselves are overrated and that cells use genes for their purposes, not vice versa. Yes. So that, that, I'm not saying that that's true. I'm just pointing out the limits of your knowledge and the limits of your weird idea that we're filled with junk DNA. It's no longer, I mean, you might be able to sustain it, but it's not that rational position to hold anymore. It's not a particularly... And cells seem to work as their own sorts of gene splicers, yes. Yeah, exactly. All right, guys, should we keep going? Sure. Yeah, let's go. Yeah. About halfway. Nissian, then he knows the future, and he knew from the start that one day he would be wiping out the majority of the human species, save Noah and his family. So why would God not just begin with Noah and his family? Why has God only ever appeared to such a small, selective group of people? And why hasn't he appeared again since, especially given the dwindling of faith across the globe that we're currently experiencing? Okay, well, I let him go a little too far. Yeah, let's, let's stop there. I want to start with the, the second question. Uh, well, this is depends on your uh, eschatology, but the idea that uh, we're going to have few faithful people left, I think Christ, when he said, uh, well, this, when the Son of Man returns, will there be any faithful left? Yeah, it's kind of what we'd expect. I mean, he seems to be somewhat uh, skeptical of finding faith when he returns. But the other thing is, why would it be, even if that's not the case, why would it be incumbent upon God to come just to do some magical woo-woo voodoo to make people believe in him again. I mean, the, the, all of Christ's ministry was don't ask God for tests because mm. I'm not going to give you any tests, you go, you godless generation. I mean, it's just, what? And I, I'd like to address the Noah thing, then I'll, we'll let Rob go. I want to address the Noah's Ark thing. I, again, I'm going to point out that this kind of video with these kinds of questions is, is what to me what is known as a gish gallop. Gish, that's named after Dwayne Gish, a creationist who atheists don't like because he does have a habit of just throwing out 50 points at once. And so, you know, he just keeps getting and So it's like you can't, you can't stop him. And now he's left a whole bunch of stuff for you to go after. That's why it takes us longer to respond to you than for you to just shoot out these shallow questions. Yeah. And by the way, I am going to call him shallow, and I'm going to accuse you, sir, of a bit of intellectual dishonesty. Because if you really wanted these answers, you'd bring a smart person on to have this conversation with you to answer these questions one at a time. Okay, sorry, I got off on a roll. Noah, there is every reason to believe the Noah's Ark story happened. The question is whether you want to read it in a super literalist way so that, uh, did you know, right now within currently what we know, nobody thinks there was a flood so big that it covered everything up to the top of Mount Everest. Um, the, the, the biblical writers would use the term, the, we'll see in the Bible the term world, 
but the world, the term of the use of the term world in the Bible, in the original Hebrew and the Greek and others, was very fluid and could mean a lot of things. It usually means the entire universe at once, but in context, it might not. The world was covered up to the tops of the mountains or the tops of the highest mountains. Well, it may well have been in the area where Noah was, because yes. we know for a fact. We know for, well, well, within reasonable scientific fact from archaeology and geology that, in fact, there was a great massive huge flood that took out large parts of Europe, the Levant, and so on uh, quite a few thousands of years ago, which is one of many reasons why every culture has got a great flood story. Just about every culture has got one, especially in those areas. So we have every reason to think that happened just so you know. You just don't have to read it so literally that there was so much water that literally every part of the globe was covered. It was certainly the world as Noah understood it and as those people understood it. And, and once again, you're expecting no, what's the word, no sophistication just for how those writers wrote and how people used to read them. So you can think- read very literally, but you don't have to, especially if you know how flexible and subtle the original languages were. Go ahead, Todd. I was going to say real quick, I, I think you, you misunderstood the question he had. It wasn't that it did the flood happen, but if God knew that he was going to destroy everybody, why didn't he just start with Noah? Which, I mean, it's still a bit of an asinine question. You could just back it up and say, well, why did he create Adam and Eve if he knew they were going to fall as well? Yeah. But but again, that's like saying, why have kids if you have a good you, – you know that they might end up possibly killing you. It's a possibility. They might, you know, grow up to become murderers. So why even bother having kids? Whether you have omniscience or not is irrelevant. It's you have probable cause to believe that by giving life, they could do things that you don't want them to do. But everybody is, most people are open to giving life. So it's like, okay, fine. That's just the side effect of giving life to things. They might act in ways you don't like. I mean, I don't know. God's omniscient does not negate free will. The people uh, uh, before the flood uh, chose freely of their own will. Uh, uh, God's knowledge uh, does not negate their own free choice. Yeah. And I mean, ultimately, the why of why did God just even not bother? Well, he knew he was going to supposedly destroy all of humanity with the flood and all and all that. Well, I'll go back to what Origen, one of the early church doctors, had to say. I, I don't remember which century he lived in, but it was only a couple centuries after Christ. And, uh, oh, man, what did Origen say? It just flew out of my head. I apologize, everybody. Um, shoot, I missed my point about Origen. Does anybody else have something else they want to put in? Not on All this, right. no. All right. Well, let's, let's, something. Oh, oh, oh. oh. That, that, that as Christians, we take the view that, that the Jews had a special revelation from God, and that's where we got what we call the Old Testament. Um, and even at the time, the Jews tended to read things in a very literalist way. And then Origen and quite a, a, the other early church fathers that said, in light of the Gospels and Christ's message, we have to view a lot of these old stories more for the message that God has for us, rather than, that, that he wants us to take away from this rather than just, well, this is a, a blunt account of what happens. So, I mean, we could probably sit here for a whole half hour and say, what is the message of Noah's Ark? But, the, the, you know, the bottom line is, is that it's, it, it, the story is a, is a message about our relationship to God and even promises God made. So, yeah, actually, we could probably talk hours about this alone. But if you were an honest inquirer, you might actually ask somebody and then ask for some literature and ask for a conversation. But it doesn't seem like you want to do this. You just want to throw out questions. Okay, let's keep going and see if we can finish this soon. Why would God prioritize his own ego in his commandments, detailing precisely how he should be worshipped above the commandments not to murder or steal? Why would God not include a commandment for parents to respect their children to go alongside the commandment for children to respect their parents? Why would God allow... Okay, first of all, uh, second question first, then we'll go back to the first one. It's so asinine. He says, why isn't there a corollary to the statement that uh, children on your parents, that children should... To, uh, parents should take care of their children. Hmm. Right after you read it in Ephesians 6 2, you read in Ephesians 6 4, and you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. It's literally two verses after the verse he says God does not tell parents to reciprocate to their children. 
ludicrous. The other thing is, why does God start with himself? Obviously, because there'd be no right or wrong. I mean, read yes. Nietzsche, read Twilight of the Idols. Nietzsche says, if the Christian God doesn't exist, Christian morality doesn't exist, i.e. murder is okay. Read Dostoevsky, Brothers Karamazov. If God does not exist, all things are permissible. You have to start from the first principle of right and wrong. And right and wrong only exist in light of God. And this, Max Stirner, Nietzsche, atheists admit this. This is not a Christian-only belief. Yeah, that's right. See, he, you, this guy phrased it as God wanting worship to, to satisfy his own ego. Yeah. Uh, again, there's, there's a little question begging there. One thing that's observable, though, is that all men worship something. This includes you, by the way, uh, Mr. Cosmic Skeptic, because it's pretty clear you worship your own ego. Not even being rude. You do. You think your own intellect. You think you're bright, and you think ever, nobody's ever thought of the answers to these questions before. You haven't asked a question yet I haven't heard before, just so you know. And there's answers to every single one of them. Why aren't you looking for them in a real way? Max, you just described every every atheist YouTube video. They're all they're all saying things that have been said before. They're all just repackaging the same old material. No way. I mean, I'm really scared that one of them are one day going to ha find out that evil exists and bad things happen to good people because that will really challenge me uh, theologically and intellectually. The Odyssey. Yeah. I, it, I, I'm sorry. That's I'm a discovery, by the way. Thanks to science, we've discovered that bad things happen to good people. Yes. Yes, yeah, exactly. All right, shall we keep going? Sure. All right, we got less than a minute. To exist. If he can eliminate the devil, then he doesn't want to, in which case he has malicious intent. If he can't eliminate the devil, then he's impotent. So which is it? Why would God harden the heart of the Pharaoh of the book of Exodus to then punish the Pharaoh with plagues for having a hardened heart? Why would God create a son to send to earth, destined to be mercilessly tortured and brutally crucified in order to forgive the sin of man, when he could have just forgiven the sin of man? And Okay, stop. There we go. Okay, the last one first. I think it was the Cappadocian father, Gregory of Nyssa, that which God has not assumed, God has not redeemed. So that answers that question. The second one... Well, uh, explain that in context a little more. I don't, I don't think... Well, sure. Basically, the idea was... This is also argued in Western medieval uh, thought with um, Anselm as others. But since man was separated from God, the way to bridge the gap was the, the only way that could happen is if God became man. To also quote an early church father, Athanasius, God became man so man could become God. Uh, the idea being that we couldn't bridge the gap on our end, but he'd have to come to our side to fix it. Yeah. It's and the, that, it's, that's the reference to cosmic skeptics' last point about Jesus. Yeah. And then the one about why did God harden Pharaoh's heart and then judge Pharaoh for doing it. Well, no, you just don't understand uh, hermeneutics. If you read Origen, I know you just mentioned Origen already, Max. Origen said that the hardening of Pharaoh's heart should be analogous to a parched desert. And uh, uh, the rain being analogous to grace would rain on the desert to, to soften the dirt, and the dirt is likened to the heart. So by withholding his grace, God is letting Pharaoh's heart bake in the sun. And God's not doing anything active. He's withholding what he can give freely. And so by withholding grace, he heart, Pharaoh's heart is hardened because it's the natural inclination of his heart. I mean, again, that he, see, he assumes all Christians are Calvinists. I'm sorry, we're not. Yeah, he, he does think like a Calvinist. I, not, not to pick too much on Calvinists. I don't like Calvinism, but I have there's some nice good people who are Calvinists. But yeah, I, 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 Rob, what do you think? Uh, I, yeah, I kind of lost track of what he was saying there. Well, again, th this is more just throwing stuff out, throwing stuff out, throwing stuff out. The biggest thing to understand, I guess we'll go into something really specifically Christian here. Christ came to redeem the world, right? Let's make sure you get the Christ concept properly. God existed before time. God exists out time beyond time. God chose at a specific point in history to become and take human form. That's the, the gospel message, okay? And so, uh, and, and just to get into a specifics of things like ideas like salvation, Christian tradition has always hold that everybody who existed before Jesus, I guess except those who don't want to, automatically get to go to heaven. 
um, he redeemed them immediately. That's even where the part where he descends into hell uh, after the after the crucifixion, after he dies, and then rises again. Tradition holds he's there to bring the the the, the people out of hell who were there by their choice to separate themselves from God. Uh, so the, the the point is, is this would be agreeing with Origen and some of the other sources, even if what seemed cruel in some of those Old Testament stories, you know, all these people being killed and whatever, um, all those people were redeemed. And so those stories now are there to serve as a lesson to us about our relationship with God and what God wants us to see. Now, you may not like that answer, but it's a very old answer, and it makes a lot of sense. And I, I think Origen's phrase was, we must read the Old Testament through the through the, the light of the Lamb of the blood of Christ, you know, the mercy of Christ. So we no longer act or interact with God the way the, the more primitive Hebrews and then the more primitive Jews, not a, not a slap on today's Jews. I have a lot of Jewish friends. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, again, you're 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 focusing on a very simplistic and kind of childish read of the book of the Old Testament, and aren't even giving any credit to countless Christian thinkers um, from the Gospel onward who've addressed these points. Mm -hmm. Why don't you again try doing a little reading rather than just snottily throwing out questions and pretending nobody's got an answer? Yeah. All right. Uh, Should we well, his first uh, his first point I just remembered. Uh, he said something about about the devil. Like, why doesn't God just take out the devil right now? Just yeah. the, the the problem of evil writ large, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, Google. Go ahead and look up a phrase called theodicy. T h e o d i c y, or just something called the problem of evil. Yeah, and you will find that 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 not just Christians but multiple people have been looking at this question for thousands of years. Even before Christ, people were asking this question about evil. So there's multiple answers. Do a little research. I mean, but the bottom line is, is that uh, the way I put it is Satan represents every, you know, Satan is the ultimate force that chose to pull, pull himself away from God, just like humans who reject God choose to pull themselves away from God. God lets us make choices, okay, because we have free will. Nobody here's a Calvinist. We all believe in free will. Okay. Shall we keep going? Sure. Yep. All right. Barely 30 seconds to go. Are you not subscribed to this channel or following me on social media? Or if you already are, well, then in the kindest and uh, most... Stop. I guess we're done. Uh, <laughs> we are done. I'll tell you what, Cosmic Skeptic. Why don't you follow us on Max Kobe Group on Twitter. Subscribe to the Max Kobe channel. And by the way open invitation for a live hangout here with me alone or with anybody in this group who'd like to. We could also do your channel too. Maybe yeah. we could actually start having conversations between atheists and, and, and religious people and not just snarking at each other. I doubt if you'll, you know, I, I'm always pleased when an atheist has the courage to do that, but usually when they do, it doesn't go that great for them because they wind up having to treat the Christian or the other religious person like a human being, not an idiot. Yeah. Still, you can open invite from any of us, I think. You'd have him on to your channel, wouldn't you, Todd? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, and and the other thing, too, is, I mean, Cosmic Skeptic really is one of the better YouTube atheists, which is, I think, why uh, I'm, I try to be more generous, but that's, why I think, why you, Max, and uh, you, John, were not quite as uh, aggressive as you you can be on people that might be more deserving. Hmm. Yeah, he really isn't that bad. He really no, he's not that bad. bad. Um, we, you know, it's it, it was partly a sign of respect that we did a response video. I think. Well, uh, it has our imprimatur. Yes, I, 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 would, I would say so because we we we've had some real knuckleheads uh, uh, on on our. We've reviewed a lot of uh, videos of knuckleheads, but I, I've gotten some people who have said, oh, you want to debate me? And But they were like people who seemed unstable, like deconverted man. It's like it just does not seem like a good character. But I'm not opposed on principle, certainly, to, to having an online debate or discussion. I, I personally, I'm like Sam Harris. I don't like anything about Sam Harris, but this one is Sam Harris doesn't do debates. He goes, does conversations because he thinks debates are inherently dishonest. And I tend to agree with his position on that. 
um, a real conversation with is 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 give and take, an exchange of views. Not one person just sitting there with his arms crossed saying, "Prove it to me." Uh, but again, the trouble there is, is if you do that, your whole your whole shtick of being the wise atheist may get crumbled because guess what? There's there's religious people who are as smart as you, and we do have answers for your questions. All right, I'm going to shut down now. Final thoughts, Todd? Uh, no, I think I think I've already said my final thoughts. Thanks for having me on, Max. Yeah, no problem. Th final thoughts from you, Rob? Uh, no. Uh, well, you just mentioned Sam Harris. Did you see his uh, trailer on Facebook? He has the uh, waking up trailer. Like it, he's promoting the hell out of it. But yeah, I have not seen Sam Harris's waking up trailer. I I cannot believe people still take Sam Harris seriously. Yeah. I really, I really can't. I, he, no, I'm going to say something rude here. Someone might get mad at me, but he's sort of Sam Harris. He's sort of the he, he's sort of the Joel Osteen of of, of atheism to me. He's just I, why does anybody follow the guy? All right, everybody. Well, please subscribe to the Deflating Atheism channel. Please subscribe to the Praise of Folly YouTube channel, and of course. Subscribe to this, the greatest, most awesome channel on YouTube, the Max Colbe channel. Um, and come on by if you actually want a conversation instead of just it, 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 let us know and we'll hear it and we'll talk with you. Okay, everybody. Well, please give us a like. Please give us a subscribe. Please tell your friends or enemies. Please support us on our funding vehicles, including on escapingatheism.com. And peace out, everybye. See you tomorrow. Have a good night. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.